title of my talk is Solving Key Biological Problems Limiting the Expansion of Yellow Perch. Um, so what, the brief overview of my talk, first of all, I'll talk about aquaculture in general and why um, we think that yellow perch is a very good species for aquaculture in the Great Lakes region, and then talk about two of the big problems with this industry, which are problems with uh, larval fish production and then the very slow growth of the fish to market size and then talk about some things that we're working on in our lab to help solve these two problems, which are um, using a polyculture system with rotifers for feast feed, first feeding of these fish when they're small, using lasers to increase their acceptance of dry diets, and um, some novel things uh, looking at growth, including some genetic manipulations in CRISPR, and a recent discovery made of a growth-promoting pheromone. So aquaculture is by far the fastest growing area of um, animal agriculture. World population is expected to more than double in the next 30 years. And as you can see from the map of the globe on the bottom there, there's really not a lot of places to grow more food, particularly animal protein, other than the oceans and water. Right now, we're actually at a point where more than half of the fish that are consumed by humans in the world are farm raised. That's what the little graph on the bottom shows. What a lot of people don't know is how um, energy efficient and resource efficient um, raising fish for animal protein is compared to other important terrestrial farm animals. In fact, um, if you look at this graph here, it only takes one pound approximately of feed to get a pound of fish compared to up to four to 10 pounds of feed to get a pound of cows, for example. The next most efficient animal production is chickens and requires two pounds of feed per um, pound of eating. The reason for that is, is that fish are cold blooded and don't use energy um, to maintain uh, body temperature. And also they don't use any energy to um, hold themselves upright because they're floating in the water. Another very interesting thing about water uh, uh, aquaculture is that it actually takes about 10 times less water to produce a kilogram of fish meat than it does to produce a kilogram of cattle. The market for fish in the Great Lakes region particularly is very large. Um, soon there will be about 16 million people living in this region, which is now known as a megapolis. Um, and the per capita consumption of fish in the U.S. right now is around 15 pounds of fish consumed per person per year, which means the potential market for fish is almost a billion pounds. Very little of this is uh, from uh, local sources. And, and most of the fish that we eat in the U.S. is imported. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, the second biggest uh, contributor to the U.S. trade imbalance is seafood after oil. Yellow perch is a really good species for aquaculture in our region. The main reasons for that are, one, there's an extremely large market for the fish, and prices are very high and probably are going to stay high. It also has many excellent uh, biological attributes uh, for an aquaculture species, although there are problems, as we'll see. So here's the market. Uh, the market size, we know for sure it's at least 50 million pounds a year, and this is based on how many fish were sold during the heyday of the Great Lakes yellow perch fishery. In the 60s and early 70s, 50 million pounds of fish were harvested from the lakes a year, and all of that uh, found its way readily to market. The U.S. supply of wild catch now and primarily this is from Lake Erie, is about 15 million pounds. Two million pounds are imported, mostly from Canada, which means the potential for aquaculture in the region is about 33 million pounds per year. And it's probably much larger than that, actually. Current aquaculture production accounts for about 0.2 million pounds per year. And the value of these fish is very high. Fish in the round sell for up to $3 a pound or more. And the current retail value for fillets is about $15 a pound. About 45% of the fish um, is a fillet. So you can see, let me go back there. So that means that right now, the market potential is you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Regarding the biological attributes of the yellow perch, these are some factors that make it very good for this. It readily accepts formulated diets. It's low on the food chain, so it has a lower protein um, requirement than things like salmon or walleyes. It's relatively disease resistant. It's stress tolerant. Things like handling, temperature changes, those sorts of things don't have a big impact. Very large number of offspring. It's easy to produce um, large numbers of eggs and, and larval fish. 
very tolerant of high densities. In fact, uh, yellow perch is our, um, a schooling fish, and they actually like to be um, reared at high densities. They're very tolerant of poor water quality. In fact, there's no limitation on growth at dissolved oxygen levels as low as three, which would uh, probably kill most trout. Very wide temperature range, so you can raise them in ponds in our region. They overwinter at very cold temperatures, and they do fine in the summer temperatures of ponds. Um, they have very good flesh yield. That 45% yield is good. And one really important quality of perch is that they have a, a very unique um, fat composition to their muscle, so they freeze extremely well. So you could harvest all your fish, freeze them, and sell them a year later, and most consumers would have no idea that they're eating a, a previously frozen filet. There's various methods to produce the perch, and they do well in both. Um, RAS stands for recirculation aquaculture systems. Because you're running pumps, you have a building, and you're heating the building in water, the cost of producing fish in RAS systems is much higher than it is in ponds. P perch do also very well in ponds. Um, and in fact, uh, I'm a proponent of the pond culture of this species. Um, you can produce right now four to 5,000 pounds of fish per acre of water, which translates to uh, a, a, over $2,000 in profit per pot per acre, which is, is a very, as you guys in agriculture would know, is a very high uh, return. So here are the problems. Um, in the bottom, you'll see that picture. Let me point that out. So the eggs readily obtained. The broodstock, each broodstock can produce even up to 50,000 eggs, 20,000 to 50,000 eggs. So eggs are no problem. But they, the larvae hatch out. They're very small. And in fact, they're so small that they cannot eat the typical live food organisms that are given to larval fish, um, like Artemia. So very high uh, larval survival uh, pro issues and, uh, and other issues. Anyway, they eventually will develop. You start to feed them dry diets, and the juveniles then grow to adults. This is the other big problem. Uh, yellow perch are extremely slow growing compared to most other important aquaculture species. And if we could solve this problem of slow growth, um, the industry could really take off. It takes about two or three years to get a market-sized fish raised in ponds and even under optimal conditions in RAS, it still takes over a year. So there's two ways to produce larval uh, yellow perch. One is to stock the newly hatched larvae into production ponds, which have been fertilized, so that there's a bloom of plankton that the fish feed on. The larvae are then, when they're you know maybe an inch long or so, are harvested from the ponds, placed into tanks, and they're transitioned from the live feeds that they're feeding on in the ponds to dry formulated diets. Um, this works pretty well, but the limitations of this approach is that you only get your um, fingerlings at one time of the year, and your ponds are now dedicated to raising small fingerlings instead of raising the fish to market size where the value is. It's also possible to raise larvae intensively. So by spawning the fish uh, in the lab, and then placing the newly hatched larvae into tanks, which have been seeded with um, live food organisms like uh, rotifers and artemia and other live food organisms they feed on, they then reach a certain size where they can now be in the lab transitions to eating dry diets. Um, a lot of work has gone into that. So something that we've worked on in our lab the last two years, and this is not really a big innovation because it had been done before in other fish species, including zebrafish. But this is a fish, and it's not a perch, but it's, I think it's a zebrafish eating an artemia. And you can see how the artemia is just too big to fit in the mouth of the fish, whereas this here, a rotifer, can readily be consumed. So people have done experiments where instead of feeding these artemia, they're adding rotifers to their tanks, you know, six, seven, eight times a day, and still, the production of the larvae indoors is, is relatively low, like 10 to 20% survival. What we discovered is that if you actually raise the larval yellow perch in a, a low saline environment, the rotifers, as long as you're feeding this algae that you can buy, will continue to grow and divide, and their populations will remain high, and the larval fish have constant access to food. And we now have results that say 50 to 70% survival of very healthy fish. 
So this is a, a I think a, a breakthrough in the in the intensive culture of this fish. The other thing that we've worked on is using lasers to stimulate feeding on dry diets. Um, sort of in all larval fish rearing, it's really good if you can get away from any reliance on live food organisms because it's very problematic. It's, it's very time consuming. It's difficult. Uh, we've had instances where our Artemia or, or I'm sorry, our rotifer populations suddenly um, declined and crashed for reasons we don't know. We didn't have food to feed the fish. So if you could rely on these very small uh, micro pelleted diets that have the nutritional needs of the fish, it's possible that we can just raise these larvae on, on complete dry diets. And there's a lot of research being done to do that. What we discovered is that yellow perch are a, uh, a visual feeder and they're, they're stimulated to feed based on the movement of their prey organisms. So we hypothesized that if we were to illuminate the dry diets as they fell through the water column with a laser, the reflection off the diet might stimulate a feeding response. And our data to date strongly supports the idea that this has potential. This is a long way from being utilized um, commercially. Um, we have to test things like light color, um, intensity of the light, and so on. But uh, it, it has promise. All right, here's a slide that illustrates the problem of slow growth with this species. So the green bar shows a growth curve. It's a very good growth curve. This would be a super fast growing rainbow trout. Rainbow trout, let's say, are harvested at a weight of about 300 grams. It takes maybe seven to eight months under these optimal conditions to get a, a large market size rainbow trout. Even though yellow perch are marketed at a weight that's you know three times lower, it takes up to two months longer to get a market size fish. So if we could somehow turn this growth curve of yellow perch into the growth curve for uh, rainbow trout, it would revolutionize this industry. So growth in fish and all vertebrates is controlled by an endocrine system. And I'll go through that in a minute. So the hypothalamus or the brain integrates signals like temperature, uh, nutritional status, stress, and so on, and sends a signal to the pituitary gland, hormonal signal to the pituitary that causes the release of growth hormone. Growth hormone then binds to the liver and causes the release of something called insulin-like growth factor, which is ultimately responsible for the elongation of the bones and muscles and, and growth itself. So one of the hormones that controls growth actually has a negative effect on growth. So we, and we've begun this work and we're having good results, we're using a new genetic manipulation method called CRISPR-Cas9 which um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's a, it's a breakthrough in gene editing. It's only been around for a few years. And what, it, what this method does is it allows you to target a specific gene sequence in the fish and knock out only the gene of interest. In the past, genetic manipulation has used kind of a shotgun approach where you're knocking out multiple genes and then screening for animals that have the desired phenotypic characteristic. With CRISPR, you can actually go in and eliminate the specific gene of interest. So what we're doing is knocking out the primary negative hormonal regulator of growth in yellow perch, and the hypothesis is that this will lead to the production of very large fish. One thing that you should realize is that fish, unlike other vertebrates, have what's called indeterminate growth. Um, their bones can continue to elongate throughout their lives, unlike humans where we have epiphyseal plate closure and we can't really grow any bigger after a certain age. Fish have literally unlimited growth potential. What's not understood, though, is what the fine regulation of this growth is. But clearly, there are fish in the wild that can reach very large sizes. So if we can understand the hormonal regulation, we can change the things to get the fish we need. Um, we can talk about more. There's, there's obviously controversy about using genetically engineered fish that we're aware of. Here's another exciting discovery in our laboratory. And it was made accidentally. Um, it was three years ago now, I raised a 200 gallon tank of larval yellow perch and they were doing fine, but uh, noticed that about half of the fish, about a thousand fish, uh, had a slight spinal deformity, probably because of a nutritional deficiency. 
So somebody wanted to buy those larvae. So I hand sorted out all the deformed fish, stuck them in another tank, and I was just going to um, euthanize them because I had no, no use for those slightly deformed fish. But in my protocol, I was also raising um, walleyes, which have to be fed live diets because these were fish that were not on dry diet. So I was able to put a walleye into that tank. And I noticed after a short period of time that the fish that were in the tank with the walleye were twice as large, literally, as the control fish in the other tank. So we set up another experiment right away where we had some control fish. We had a, a tank where we stuck a walleye in the tank with the perch. And then we also had another trial where we put a tank with walleye um, fed yellow perch, but the water from that tank flowed into the tank below that contained the perch. This was uh, really our first attempt to see if this was a pheromone. So these are the data. In the control fish, we got steady, slow growth. In this tank where there was continuous input of odor from the walleye that ate a perch, they ate a perch at least every day, we saw significant increase in the growth rate. And then in the fish where the walleye was in the tank with the perch, we were surprised to see that there was no growth like we had seen previously. But when we counted the perch, we realized that the walleye was too small and had not eaten any of the perch. So we stuck a larger walleye in at this point, and the growth rate suddenly increased. We did another experiment where we tested control walleyes fed yellow perch, walleyes fed di dry diet, and walleyes fed fathead minnows. Our hypothesis with the minnows is that the perch would not grow. We thought this would be a, spe a species specific effect. But what we found was, is that in the two treatments where the walleyes were fed live fish, they grew significantly faster than the controls or the system where the walleye had um, been fed dry diets. And this is what that difference looks like. It's quite remarkable. So the implications of this discovery are that if we can get about a 50% faster growth rate, first of all, if we can spawn Let's say that this is January, the middle of winter. This is now, now we're in May, and in your pond, you've just stocked a bunch of very small yellow perch, and they're growing very slowly, and you've got about six months of production. May, June, July, August, September, October. You're going to have a fish that's maybe 40 grams, not anywhere near market size. However, if we could spawn these fish in January, and stock the ponds now with a 20 to 40 gram fish, and we could reduce the time it takes to get the fish to a market size by a couple of months by increasing their growth rate with a hormone, you literally have the foundation of a pond-based aquaculture industry that functions just like any other agriculture in our region where you plant your seeds in the spring and harvest all of your crop in the winter. This has multiple advantages. You get all your fish to market. And remember I said you can fillet and store these fish frozen with no impact on their price. You can also now drain the water in your ponds so you can sterilize the ponds and get rid of things like bullfrogs and insects that can prey on the fish. And the other issue is that what happens when you overwinter your perch, which you have to do if you, if, you know, under this scenario, right? You're in the winter time. You have to overwinter, and then they start to grow again in the spring. Um, the, the perch have a very high fecundity, and the females put on a lot of eggs, and you have to wait several months for them to spawn their eggs and recover the weight that they had after they spawned. By harvesting the before the winter, they never undergo gonadal maturation, so that's another uh, really large advantage. All right, that's my talk. Um, I want to say that there's some more information. There's a very good uh, book that came out uh, two years ago called The Biology and Culture of Pursed Fishes. A um, lot of information on the biology of this animal and how to culture it. Uh, we published a paper on our pheromone work, which is listed here. Um, a lot of the research on yellow perch has been funded by the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, which is administered out of uh, um, Iowa State University. Um, lots of, if I, if you click on these, you can find uh, access to all kinds of databases. And a lot of the work that we've done in our lab over the years has been funded by the Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute. All right. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Hello?
Okay, Terry. Thank okay, you. Terry. Thank you. For that. So I'm going to so I'm going to shoot the screen. Are you able to? Are you able to? You're coming and going, but I can sort of hear you. Okay. Okay. Oh, there we so, go. Well, so what? I think probably uh, the better, probably, uh, the better thing to do is why don't you uh, take a look at the questions as they chat up in the chat box and uh, do your best to do your best to read them out loud. And them out loud and Very answer. good. Okay, so Chris Payne asked, "What about reaction to GMOs?" Um, there is now a GMO fish called the Aqua Vantage. Atlantic salmon, which has been approved for production and sale in the U.S. Um, the, the key to allowing that use was that this fish has to be reared in an RAS system in a biosecure facility. In other words, there's literally no chance that those fish could ever escape into the wild. There is a very strong negative uh, bias against GMO fish. Um, we're not necessarily pushing this CRISPR fish of ours, but we thought it was important to start to do the research so that if and when the world population doubles in 30 years, we have the tools that allow us to do what we need to do in order to feed the hungry world. That's sort of our approach. So in other words, we're building the technology. We're not necessarily advocating the commercial production of this fish quite yet. Um, James asked, can you talk more about the fish climate where the growth pheromone is more or less effective? Can you talk more on the fish climate? I'm not exactly sure what Jim's asking here. Um, we, we've tested it in three species now. It only works in perch so far. It did not increase the growth of fathead minnows or walleyes. And we think that makes sense perhaps evolutionarily, given the position that yellow perch have in the food chain, where they're um, subject to predation by numerous species, and they're, they're themselves a predator fish that schools. Um, it may be an evolutionary adaptation for their specific ecological niche. We're not sure about that, but um, we've, we've done this work repeatedly, and we're getting the same results. It's kind of a new idea. There are there is evidence from the literature that other fish will change their shape. A lot of the work was done on the crucian carp. Um, the carp actually gets a little bit wider bodied quickly in response to predation, and they think that's what doesn't fit in the predator's mouth. The yellow perch seems to grow uniformly bigger. Uh, the advantage of that might be they can swim faster and they don't fit in, the, in a predator's mouth. Um, the other thing we, we're discovering, it seems to be a window when this pheromone works, and when the fish get outside that window, uh, the pheromone uh, doesn't work anymore, which also we think makes sense. Uh, Jeff asked, do you see your effort targeting recreational fishing or specifically cage fish? Our work, you know, my particular interest is fish physiology and endocrinology. So um, m most of my work has been funded to do aquaculture research. I'm interested in both, um, you know, fish as fish per se, but also um, using the knowledge we gain to, to help increase aquaculture production. Uh, Julie asked about water contamination with aquaculture. Um, I, I mean, yes, I mean, aquaculture compared to agriculture in particular is, is very highly regulated. Um, it's very difficult to get permits to put in new um, fish farms, particularly farms like uh, trout, which require very high quality uh, running water. One of the advantages of raising yellow perch, and whether I'm a proponent of the pond culture of this species, is that these animals can be raised in ponds, um, you know, in the middle of a farm field. You can dig a pond and raise these animals, where the, the, the impact on the environment is going to be a lot less than it would be in, say, a trout farm, where their waste are continually flowing through your system. Because um, they require very high quality moving water, um, and you need a lot more efforts to kind of mitigate the potential pollution from those effects. There's been efforts to do cage culture in the Great Lakes, which have all been rejected. Um, the Atlantic salmon industry is based primarily on these large offshore um, facilities in nets. Um, there are issues where the uneaten feed, for example, falls below the cages and pollutes the bottom. But now efforts are made to move those further offshore and to put them in areas where there's more mixing of the water and so on. So there's a lot of work being done to mitigate the environmental impact 
but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There are obviously environmental impacts for any animal uh, agriculture. Amy asks, where do you think production cost needs to get before we see stronger increase in production and fewer imports? Um, yeah, I mean, the my personal opinion is that aquaculture, and this has been said for the last, I've, I've worked here for 30 years and every year we say the same thing, we're on the verge of seeing a rise in aquaculture. Um, I think that actually may be uh, true now. We're, we're at a point where the demand for fish continues to increase as the natural catch continues to decline. Um, consumers are aware more and more of the health benefits of eating fish. Um, they're also aware of the health problems with eating wild caught fish that could have um, pollutants or mercury in their in their meat and whereas aqu aquacultured fish or, or is a pure product so I think we're just it's just going to be a it's it's normal economics right as the demand increases um, the price will increase and the technology that we're working on you know one bit at a time as we as we Chick away at this stuff, get get larval costs down by improving production, get growth rates up so farmers can better utilize their, their space instead of holding ponds for two years to get a market sized fish. They get a market sized fish every year. All these things are to contribute to the growth of the industry. Um, it's very profitable to be a fish farmer, um, I think, compared to other types of agriculture. Uh, Jeff asks about uh, fish consumer market. Are there studies on fish preferences? Like what do people prefer to eat? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could clink, click on the link, the NICRAC uh, link here, and there's uh, lots of literature on that. Um, John Mann, will you talk a little bit about your lab's next step? Also, what you may be seeking from industry. So with the pheromone work, which is the most uh, advanced work that we're doing now, We've written grants um, with private yellow perch producers to try to use the pheromone idea already. Um, there's one producer who raises both walleyes and yellow perch in separate ponds at his facility, and he feeds his walleyes minnows to keep them alive. And what he intends to do is pump some of the water from that walleye pond into his perch pond in an effort to move the pheromone over to his perch to see if he can get them to grow bigger. We've also considered using things like floating net pens in the perch ponds that contain walleyes that are fed minnows or perch to see if that has an effect. Um, we're gonna start um, some experiments this spring also doing work similar to what we've done, but on a larger scale. Instead of using small tanks, we're gonna use larger tanks with more fish and, and get a better handle on exactly what types of growth increases we can expect. The other thing we're trying to do is actually identify what the growth promoting pheromone is and if we can identify it and slightly modify it, um, possible we might be able to uh, get a patent on that technology and then use just a chemical that you add to the water to get these perch to grow quicker. So it's, that's sort of the things we're doing. With the CRISPR project, um, it's very difficult with yellow perch, but we've um, modified, we've knocked out the gene of interest in zebrafish. And now we're starting a series of experiments to really look at exactly what impact that uh, knockout gene has on growth and other uh, factors that influence uh, production of the fish. Uh, the laser work is pretty young. We, we've we got, the one result we got was done, unfortunately, in a not a well replicated study. It's, it, we can't publish it, but in the replicates that we had, we more or less doubled the production and survival of yellow perch with the laser fed just dry diets. The other problem with the study with the lasers, we were feeding just dry diets, and it really hasn't been worked out yet that you can raise a, a yellow perch larvae without live feed. So we got pretty low survival in that study. So what we're going to do with the lasers is do a, a, a repeated experiment with more replicates where the fish are initially, initially fed live feed so that they're you know robust and healthy, and then transition to dry diets with and without the laser and see how that works. And then there's things to do, like I said, uh, color and intensity and should the lights be blinking or just continually be on and so on. Uh, pretty optimistic about it, but it's going to be a slow process. We can only get yellow perch um, larvae once a year. So we have to do all this work, you know, in a real tight window and we got other things going on. So 
Uh, my guess is that that that's going to be a little ways down the road. Any, uh, party Any uh, party No, um, John, I really appreciate you inviting me to do this. Um, it forced me to kind of think about some things. I hadn't put it together quite in this way before. Um, I think the problems I've identified, slow growth being probably the most important. It's actually easy to raise a lot of fingerlings in ponds. Um, so fingerlings are available, but the slow growth, really you saw that growth curve of rainbow trout versus perch. I don't think perch is ever really going to be an important species until we can solve this growth issue. So di different ways to do it besides the approaches we're taking. I guess that's something I want to say is a lot of researchers doing a lot of different approaches to get aquaculture going in this region. Um, and these are just some approaches, but it, it, you know, funding and everything else in this matter is going to really count towards uh, our progress.